problem of AIDS would definitely be a very big problem. It would be the biggest problem, the way I look at it. Since the, 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 the world wars, I think this would be the biggest problem the world will ever face. And, uh, and, and uh, governments should be doing everything possible to prepare themselves for the worst. Of the 14 million HIV positive people and two and a half million with AIDS, 80% are in the developing world. Yet some Western journalists dismiss the African AIDS epidemic as a myth. This film will show that AIDS, far from being exaggerated, has been underestimated and misunderstood. The film was made in Zambia and India and represents people who believe HIV leads to AIDS and subsequent death. Because it spreads via sexual activity, HIV attacks those in the prime of working life. Once a country's workforce starts to develop AIDS, the epidemic will be posing a challenge to development itself. Already, a quarter of Zambia's sexually active adults are HIV positive. In India, there are still only about 12,000 reported cases of HIV and under 400 of AIDS, representing a minute fraction of its enormous, ever-growing population. But alarmingly, the epidemic is accelerating here at a pace similar to that of sub-Saharan Africa in the 1980s. India's hope is the lessons it can draw from Africa. Zambia's hope is saving its younger generation. Though within the next three years, AIDS will kill more children in sub-Saharan Africa than malaria and measles. Adults are now pulling together to confront the crisis facing their country. Already, health services are overextended, and agriculture and industry could soon be hard hit by AIDS. Copper earns three quarters of Zambia's foreign exchange and is thus essential to Zambia's development. But already, miners are falling ill or taking time off for funerals. Godfrey Ngosa is a skilled miner, but has been unable to work since developing AIDS-related illnesses. He was diagnosed HIV positive in 1992. But it is women who are proving to be increasingly vulnerable to the virus, and young women especially are easily infected. Women also have to be responsible for others. Not only is Godfrey's wife HIV positive, but she is prevented from earning a living by having to care for her sick husband. She <laughs> A short walk from Godfrey's house is Wusakili Mine Hospital. Dr. Veronica Malenga, who has worked here for nearly two years, is one of the many doctors coping with a growing intake of patients with AIDS. They're having a lot of patients who are HIV positive who come in with AIDS-related illnesses. In the long run, if patients don't change, if people don't change their habits and this AIDS keeps on spreading, it means there will be more patients who are HIV positive in the world and less beds for people with uh, simple illnesses. The way I see it, even now, um, the health service is quite strained. This problem cannot be solved by the medical personnel alone. It has to be solved uh, by the society. So it means everybody has to be involved, the families, even the communities. So I think... Um, Home-based care will be the solution when everybody is willing to contribute to the upkeep of these patients. Skilled workers at all levels could start to fall ill and die faster than replacements can be trained. 
This will mean that output will ultimately slow down. Once manufacture of any crucial export starts to suffer, the country's economic balance is threatened. The effect on development could be devastating. Agriculture is equally challenged by an illness like AIDS, which kills. In Africa, most farming is labor-intensive, and small farmers rely on people rather than machinery to work the fields. People who are now being infected with HIV and developing AIDS. Less people means less crops. AIDS could threaten Zambia's very ability to feed itself. Sam and Dala's story is typical of the plight of many small farmers. He used to grow maize and sorghum in his grandfather's field until he developed AIDS. So, if you... So, Sam is now being looked after by his grandparents, a phenomenon typical of so many communities in which the traditional family unit has been destroyed by AIDS. Community-led responses, which help spread the burden of caring for the sick, are becoming more and more necessary. Dr. Manessa Piri gave up medicine when he became frustrated at his inability to stop AIDS patients dying. He now believes Zambia can best prevent the spread of HIV by broadcasting information through all media available. AIDS is no longer uh, just a health problem. It is an economic problem. It is a social problem. It is a, a community problem. It is a political problem. So the multisexual approach is, is, is the answer. But also I think it is an individual problem. I think every individual in Zambia has got to think of AIDS in individual terms. In India, AIDS is not yet an individual problem and the epidemic is still at an early stage. Yet there is a strong link between poverty and vulnerability to the virus. Poor people have inadequate health care and are more likely to be illiterate with no access to the media and information about HIV and AIDS. Other factors associated with poverty are likely to spread the virus, particularly migration to the cities, which leads to a breakdown of traditional family patterns and community support systems. NGO AIDS cell was set up in 1991. It is one of many Indian initiatives encouraged by the National AIDS Control Organization and supported by the United Nations Development Program, which recognize that the challenges of HIV and AIDS need to be met at a community level. Dr. Shankar Chowdhury is one of the cell's founders. One very important thing that I would like to tell the countries where the AIDS cases are fewer, don't deny it. And don't wait for it to knock at your door. Just start the activities because it's going to come. You know, I had a, a, a delegation of Indian doctors and professors some time back um, come to my office when I was working as a doctor. And uh, somebody asked me exactly this question, that if you had one piece of advice to give to India, uh, this is about a year or so ago now, what would it be? And I say it, it has to be that if you do have a problem, admit it and say we have a problem, recognize it, and begin to do something about it now. Uh, my name is Simon Mulenga, and uh, I'm 29 years old. I'm HIV positive. Yeah, my name is David Chipanta. I'm 22 years old, and uh, I'm infected with HIV. Uh, my name is Winston Zuru. I'm 29 years old, and I'm HIV positive. Winston Zulu shocked Zambians into facing up to the reality of AIDS by being the first HIV-positive person to go public. Now he is a well-known figure in the community. When I went public, then it was a big embarrassment to the family. AIDS at that time, no one had gone public. I was the first person to declare myself positive. And you know, just the, the word AIDS, it was a very big stigma to, 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 to have a young brother with HIV, you know, and I just went 
like a big pool and, and, and told the whole world I was HIV positive. In Zambia, most people now know someone who has died of AIDS. This is helping to overcome stigma and encourage communities to unite and take action. Well, first of all, I was um, uh, found to be HIV positive when I was 26 years old, which is about 1990. I'm 29 now. And um, I wasn't sick. I was just, uh, uh, I'd received a scholarship from the United Nations Independence Party, which was our ruling party then. And um, we were supposed to go to the Soviet Union in about um, five days' time. So they asked us to go for a quick medical checkup, which included HIV uh, test. And uh, when we went there, we were seven of us who went, and five of us were found to be HIV positive. Um, and I couldn't believe it. Winston had a second test, which reconfirmed the diagnosis. He now lives at Hope House, a community center for HIV-positive people offering counseling and training. Counseling has proved so effective that a number of them have formed the Positive and Living Squad, or PALS, a group dedicated to preventing HIV through education. Simon was thrown out by his family when he was diagnosed HIV-positive in 1990. Hostility and discrimination against people with HIV is only too common. But Simon found strength and a sense of purpose from the counseling he received. Now Simon, like Winston and the other pals, spends what time he can telling people in schools and workplaces the truth about AIDS. So I know you've read much about AIDS. That explains why some chairs are so empty. You know, when people just hear there's an AIDS talk, they shun the talk, you know, they don't want to be there, they don't want to have anything to do with AIDS. But I'm sure we must know that AIDS is real. I'm sure when I walked into this room, none of you knew I was HIV positive. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's the biggest question people ask. How does an, an AIDS patient look like? How, how does a person who can infect you look like? You know, a person who can infect you is a person you are seated next to. That's the person who's going to infect you, you know? <laughs> the PAL's message to workplaces is beginning to be heard. Barclays Bank was one of the first multinationals to respond. This was because Barclays staff started to die at an alarming rate. Five times as many people died in 1992 than in 1987, and the cost of those deaths eroded company profits. Today, all Barclays staff are educated about HIV and AIDS by a full-time health counselor. Now, I would like to remind you that this subject does break the barriers of whatever you think is a taboo in an African culture. I'll talk about the human anatomy freely in a subject like this for the purpose of us understanding it. I hope we are together. Uh -huh. Wright frequently visits staff who are sick. This is part of Barclays' policy to keep morale and performance levels high. If the staff are educated about uh, uh, the stigma behind AIDS and they are told to accept the fact that one can work and live with uh, uh, an AIDS uh, uh, or HIV infected person, uh, staff live longer and work better and uh, the company achieves its objectives in terms of efficiency. Today Bright is visiting the Lubinda family. Burns Lubinda is one of Barclays top men in foreign exchange but has been off work with TB for over a year. How are you? Much better. Uh, much better. My son. And how is he? Oh, I'm sure oh fine. The wife as well? Getting, getting there. Okay. Okay. TB is the main cause of death among HIV-positive adults in Africa because it is already a killer and up to four times as likely to kill someone with HIV. Because of the hold it is gaining among people with HIV, TB is posing an increasingly grave threat to the population at large. Um, let us pray. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Lord, we ask thee to glorify these grounds, brighten them up, Lord, for us to be able to mention your name because we may not be worth it before you forgive us. 
We ask for your forgiveness, Lord, so that our bodies are free. AIDS is terrible. Yeah. You can't compare it with anything else. And sometimes, you know, I, I, I feel I'm in a very, uh, I'm in a predicament because when I go out to talk to people, I'm, I'm supposed to be portraying this picture that you can live with HIV, look, you can make it normal. But at the same time, I know that it's the most abnormal thing to happen to someone, you know. Meanwhile, India is teetering on the brink of its own epidemic. Here in Bombay, in just seven years, the number of prostitutes with HIV has multiplied by 20. Because men transmit HIV to women more efficiently than women to men, prostitutes are at great risk from their clients, especially the poorer ones who can't insist that clients use condoms. Dr. Galada set up the Indian Health Organization to start AIDS awareness campaigns in 1985 and has been working in the red light districts ever since. Some of Gelada's methods and his outspokenness have earned him a reputation as a self-publicist, but he believes speaking out is essential. Africa was caught unawares. In India, we have been always comparing India with African countries since 85 and more so since 87. Had we intervened at that time in a vigorous manner, on war footing, I think the situation would have been much different. We lost the precious five to seven years period. Giving prostitutes the power to insist that men use condoms is essential if they are not to remain vulnerable to infection. Most people feel that uh, it's the prostitutes who are infected and it's the prostitutes who pass the virus to the others. And so if I, as a person, I don't go to a prostitute, I'm not at risk. But that's not true. Behavior change will never happen while people think HIV can only infect so-called high-risk groups like prostitutes. It is high-risk behavior which needs to be targeted, and that includes all sexual activity. Here, warehouse loaders live away from their families and can put themselves and their wives back home at risk through extramarital sex. The Bombay Municipal Council runs a campaign to distribute information and condoms, and the team visits the docks every day to promote safe sex. <laughs> Ninety percent of these people are come from the rural area. They are staying here without their families. Then there is no other entertainment facilities at all. They can't see the TV. They can't afford to see, go to the cultural programs. So there is the only entertainment they left at to have a sex. To have a sex with the commercial sex worker or with their colleagues. With, there are some many homosexual incidents also. They get uh, infection here and then they go to their native places and they, they may pass the infection to their wives or their partners over there. The World Health Organization estimates that by the year 2000 there will be 13 million women with HIV and research now shows that young women between 15 and 25 are particularly susceptible to infection due to physical immaturities. Strategies for protecting women from HIV are urgently needed. 
This clinic for sexually transmitted diseases, or STDs, was started by a new organization, Women in AIDS. This woman is being treated for gonorrhea. Women often have inadequate access to health care for the treatment of lesions and infections like gonorrhea, syphilis, and genital herpes, which, if untreated, increase the likelihood of HIV infection by 50%. Since India has the highest rate of STDs in the world, initiatives like this are essential. Women in AIDS is also working in the community, using group discussions to confront the areas which leave women vulnerable. Women are vulnerable on several levels. Young women are the most frequent victims of rape, incest, and adultery, while women in general rarely have the power to control their sex lives. On another level, Many people are dependent on women, especially children. As people fall sick with AIDS, they too will depend on women. Women's role in preventing HIV and in home-based care is enormous. Women now need all the support they can get, and particularly from men. This is the main road between Madras and Calcutta. Traveling spreads HIV. Everyone from long-distance truck drivers to commercial salesmen and tourists are at risk on long journeys when casual sex might be difficult to resist. The road is lined with tea shops offering cheap food and a bed for the night. Sharif works for the South India AIDS Prevention Program. The program believes in targeting lorry drivers and other travelers, alerting them to the dangers of casual sex. Sharif's nights are long. Once it gets dark, he moves into a small office behind a tea stall, where informal educational discussions continue. While India struggles to educate its vast adult population about HIV and AIDS, Zambia's hope is to save its younger generation. David, like Winston and Simon, is a member of PALS. Okay, maybe one thing that you need to know is that in the session you might find me humorous, but remember we are talking about something which is very serious. We are talking about HIV. I'm just bringing in these dogs to activate you. Anyway, I was saying the Ministry of Health is saying that one in every four of the people in the sexually active population is in fact infected with HIV, has the virus which in the long run is going to bring in him the condition of AIDS. So in other words, what that, what that means is that a quarter of everyone in here, including the, 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 the crew here, would be carrying the virus. <laughs> I didn't know that AIDS was so dangerous. And I hope you can do something so that um, they can stop this discrimination whereby if you've got the AIDS virus, you can't get a job or something. David's courage was really something. You know, it really teaches us that, you know, even though you've got the disease, it doesn't mean that you, can, you could die just like that. The bigger percentage of uh, Zambians, about, they say about 50, 55 to 60 percent, uh, below the age of 15. So actually, Zambia is a young nation. If they can save that part of the population, which is uh, negative, HIV negative, then maybe there's hope. While Zambia faces its future bravely, Indian NGOs are working to prevent HIV at community level. The importance of involving the community has led to many initiatives. Here, street theater is a means of drawing the community together and alerting old and young alike to the dangers and means of HIV infection. Here, actors demonstrate the dangers of sharing needles. 
Already one of India's northeastern states has a high rate of HIV infection linked to the prevalence of intravenous drug use. Preventing the epidemic from reaching African proportions is going to be a major challenge for India during the next decade. We are very fortunate that this epidemic in our society started very late. So we have the hindsight knowledge of those countries who have faced the brunt of this problem. So it's very important that we learn from these lessons and we don't make these same mistakes again and again. Uh, I'm just kind of dumbfounded. I sometimes try to think about this thing. And sometimes I try to imagine why people don't want to think about it. Because when I think of people my age and Simon's age and people in 35, 36, 38 or 25, you know, all of them wiped out. All 30% of those wiped out. Everything. It will reflect on everything. It will reflect on the economy, on, 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 on families, on religion, you know. I think people wonder whether there's a God or anything, you know. If I